There is no point in indulging in wishful thinking with the illusions of any kind of optimism. Today, we find ourselves at the end of a cycle, already for centuries, at first insensibly, then with the momentum of a landslide. Multiple processes have destroyed every normal and legitimate human order in the West and falsified every higher conception of living, acting, knowing and fighting. And the momentum of this fall, its velocity, its giddiness, has been called progress. And we have raised hymns to progress and deluded ourselves that this civilization, a civilization of matter and machines, was civilization par excellence, the one for which the entire history of the world was preordained, until the final consequences of this entire process has been such as to cause some people at least to wake up. It is well known where and under what symbols the forces for a possible resistance tried to organize. On one side, a nation that, since it had been unified, had known nothing but the mediocre climate of liberalism, democracy, and a constitutional monarchy, dared to assume the symbol of Rome as the basis for a new political conception and a new ideal of virility and dignity. Analogous forces awoke in the nation that in the Middle Ages had made the Roman symbol of Imperium its own in order to reaffirm the principle of authority and the primacy of those values that are rooted in the blood, race and the deepest powers of a stock. And while in other European nations, groups were already orienting themselves in the same direction, a third force in Asia joined the ranks, the nation of the Samurai in which the adoption of the outer forms of its modern civilization had not yet prejudiced its fidelity to a warrior tradition centered upon the symbol of the solar empire of divine right. No one claims that there was a very clear discrimination between the essential and the accessory in these currents. That in them the ideal was confronted by people of high quality who understood it or that various influences arising from the very forces that had to be combated had been overcome. The process of ideological purification would have taken place at a later time, once some immediate and unavoidable political problems had been resolved. But even so, it was clear that a marshalling of forces was taking shape representing an open challenge to modern civilization, both to those democracies that are the heirs of the French Revolution and to the other one, which represents the extreme limit of the degradation of Western man, the collectivistic civilization of the fourth estate, the communist civilization of the faceless mass man. Rhythms accelerated and tensions increased until the opposing forces met in armed combat. What prevailed was the massive power of a coalition that did not draw back from the most hybridized of agreements and the most hypocritical ideological mobilization in order to crush the world that was raising itself and intended to affirm its right. Whether or not our men were equal to the task, whether Evers were committed in matters of timing preparation or the assessment of risks. Let us leave that aside because it does not prejudice the internal significance of the struggle that was fought. Equally, it does not interest us that today history is taking its revenge on the victors. That the democratic powers, after allying themselves with the forces of red subversion to conduct the war all the way to the senseless extremism of unconditional surrender and total destruction, today see their allies of yesterday turn on them as a danger much more frightening than the one they wanted to exercise. The only thing that counts is this. Today we find ourselves in the midst of a world in ruins. The problem to pose is, do men on their feet still exist in the midst of these ruins? 
and what must they do? What can they still do?